Welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association. I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President of the Association, and I will serve as moderator today. Alumni who wish to ask a question, please enter your first name and your location into the uh, screen, the form on your screen, and then enter your question, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Our guest today is Institute Professor Penny Chisholm. For those who of you not familiar with her work, Professor Chisholm's career to date has given us a better understanding of the magnificence of the oceans and one profound impact and the profound impact one small bacterium about a millionth of a meter in length has on life on Earth. Professor Chisholm has traveled around the world to research this bacterium called Prochlorococcus. This research has not only improved our understanding of marine ecosystems but change the way we think about what it means to be a species, and more generally about the ecology and evolution of living systems. The world has recognized the impact of Professor Chisholm's research. In 2010, she earned the Agassiz Medal from the National Academy of Sciences. In 2013, she earned the National Medal of Science. And last year, Professor Chisholm earned the Institute's Killian Faculty Achievement Award, along with being named Institute Professor. Professor Chisholm, thank you for joining us. Please start us off by giving us a little overview of uh, some of your current projects in your lab that excite you. Thank you, Judy. First, I want to thank you for inviting me to, to do this, and also uh, for all of you out there who are tuned in, thanks for coming. Um, be before I start on the specifics of, of our work, I wanted to, to show a few slides just describing sort of the, the big picture context of of our work, which is is uh, the focus of everything is on phytoplankton in the oceans, and most people don't appreciate the significance of, of these tiny microscopic plants. So uh, I'd like to always put them in context. So let me just show you a few slides, um, and then we'll talk more specifically about Prochlorococcus. First of all, just looking at at if we look at photosynthesis on the planet. Um, and this, this slide just shows the flux of CO2 from the atmosphere into the plants on land and into the phytoplankton. And uh, you can see that phytoplankton are responsible for about half of the photosynthesis on the planet, even though in terms of biomass, they're just a tiny fraction of the total photosynthetic biomass. And I show this slide because you can see on the left that um, the burning of fossil fuels, which puts CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, that looks like a tiny, tiny arrow compared to the, the CO2 that is, is fluxing through the plants on land and animals on land and, and plants and animals in the, in the ocean. And that's why it's so important to understand these arrows, the, the amount of CO2 that is going through this natural cycle in order to understand the influence that we as humans are having uh, on, on the cycle. And the other thing that people really don't uh, remember is that if it weren't for phytoplankton uh, billions of years ago, we wouldn't have oxygen in our atmosphere. And it was an imbalance of this photosynthesis and the respiration uh, of the planet that actually buried the fossil fuels that we're burning today uh, in, the, in the early evolution of the Earth. And so if it weren't for those phytoplankton, we wouldn't have fossil fuels and we wouldn't have uh, oxygen in, in our atmosphere. And this is all building up to give me a chance to give a plug for my children's <laughs> books, um, which uh, really summarize what I just told you in three different books. There's one on photosynthesis on land, one on photosynthesis in the oceans, and one on which we call buried sunlight that is about the evolution of, of photosynthesis on the earth and how that um, buried fossil fuel, uh, which is basically solar energy, and um, how that is cha has changed the earth and continues to change the earth. And um, I wrote these books because I just feel passionate about uh, the fact that most people don't really uh, understand these fundamental processes on, on, on the earth. So uh, through reaching children, I hope to also reach adults with these. With these. So moving on to phytoplankton in our work, um, before about 19, 80, around 1979, uh, we thought phytoplankton ranged in size from about 10 microns to uh, even a millimeter as colonial ones, that, though you see those on the, on the left on this slide. Um, 
And then in 1979, it was discovered that there are these tiny little bacteria uh, called Synecococcus that are a little bigger than one micron um, that dominate the phytoplankton in the oceans. And then in 1985, we were studying those, the Synecococcus, and uh, noticed some even smaller, less than, a, less than a micron in diameter, tiny little cells that are circled here in red, I mean in, in a white circle, they fluoresce red under a fluorescence mis microscope because they have chlorophyll, um, and those are what turned out to be Prochlorococcus. And the combination of Prochlorococcus and Synecococcus, these two tiny little um, bacteria, it's been analogized to discover, discovering grass on land. It's as if we didn't know there was grass and then one day there was grass. <laughs> uh, so these guys are really important in the photosynthesis uh, of the oceans. So this uh, next slide is what is Prochlorococcus? Well, over the years studying it, uh, finally got it into culture. It's, a, it's a, what's called a cyanobacterium. Sometimes those are, those are called blue-green algae. And it turns out that it's the most abundant photosynthetic cell on the planet. We've estimated there are 10 to the 27th, uh, a billion, billion, billion of these cells on the, in, the, in the global oceans. And so studying them over the years, uh, I've come to understand that this is a, a beautiful model system for uh, really understanding fundamental features of, of living systems. It's the simplest photosynthetic cell, the smallest cell. Um, it's globally distributed. Uh, we can study it in the ocean, we can study it in the lab. And now with genomic techniques, we can really get at the underpinnings of, of its uh, photosynthetic mechanism and its diversity. And the more important thing is that we can also measure the environment while we're studying it. And there's a new thrust in, in the biological sciences that to uh, which some people refer to the new biology, which is really not just to understand organisms, but to understand organisms and how they interact with their environment and understand them across all of these different scales. So that, in this final slide, shows the focus of the, the research in my lab, which I call integrative systems biology, in which we're studying a single species from the genome scale all the way up to the scale of the biosphere. Um, and, I, and I feel very strongly that, that it's only through this approach um, that we, we can fully understand the fundamental processes of life. Thank you. Um, that's terrific. Uh, do you want to show your show and tell at this oh, point? Oh, yes. Yes, I brought along um, a, a little prop here. And this is a, a, a jug of Prochlorococcus <laughs> from the lab that has uh, about 10 billion cells in it. Um, and it really is Prochlorococcus. It could be green food coloring, but uh, 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 they just gave it to me this morning. Um, so that's what it looks like in all of its beauty. And its green color is, is chlorophyll, just like plants on land. And of course, in the oceans, they're not that dense, so you don't see uh, the green color. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we've got questions coming in from alumni as usual. But first, let me ask you just one or two of my own. Um, in your Killian lecture last spring, you said that our view of life on Earth is skewed, that we don't truly understand the impact of photosynthesis. Please explain what you mean by this. I guess, uh, yeah, that statement came, comes from, uh, there was a study done by the Harvard-Smithsonian Institute um, some, some years ago, you can find it online, but where they interviewed uh, graduates of, of Harvard and M MIT on, on, on graduation day. And they, and they said, you know, they had, here's, a, here's a log, they had a piece of wood, and here's a seed. Where does the mass of that log come from? And none of these students, and you can find this on YouTube, too, the, the, this question has been asked a lot of different places, and, and people don't realize that most of it comes from the air. The carbon biomass in, the, in trees and bark and everything is, is from CO2 from the air, um, carbon dioxide. And that's such a fundamental feature of life on Earth that, that even though we learn it in school over and over and over, and, and you know, in, in the children's books, I think that there, there's no more important process on Earth than photosynthesis because the carbon in us comes from the air because it comes from eating the plants that photosynthesize. And so um, 
the, I think that's such a fundamental, fundamental aspect of life on Earth that people don't understand. Uh, that I, it, 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 it influences the way we think about climate change, the carbon cycle, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, if we don't realize we're embedded in the cycling of these elements and that we all rely on, as I tell my, 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 my biology class, every time you look at a tree or a green plant, you should be thanking it for the oxygen it's putting <laughs> into the atmosphere. I mean, they're, they're out there doing their job. So Indeed. Secondly, you've said you admire Prochlorococcus for being the smallest amount of genetic coding that can convert inorganic compounds into organic ones. How have advances in genetics in the past decade influenced or changed the path of your research? Yeah, uh, Prochlorococcus was one of the first um, bacteria to have its genome sequenced and, and that completely changed the way we were able to study them. And the, the, when we started out, we had two different strains that we knew were, that had been isolated, one from the, the surface of the Mediterranean Sea and one from the deep water in the Sargasso Sea. And we had measured their properties as a function of light intensity, how fast they grew, and, and we knew they were different physiologically, but we didn't know how different. And once we had their genome sequenced, we realized they were very different at the genomic level. And over the years, fast forward in the last uh, three or four years, we've sequenced uh, about 45 different strains from all over the global oceans. And we've learned that there's an enormous amount of genetic diversity among them. So that's why when I say it's changing the way we think about a species, each individual cell has about 2,000 genes. But every time we sequence a new strain, we see 200 new genes that we've never seen before. And these are, are, are genes that have completely different functions. It's, um, it's not like blue eyes and brown eyes in humans. It, it's like some cells can use nitrate as a nitrogen source and other cells can't. I mean, it completely changes their lifestyle. And um, it's projected that all of the Prochlorococcus theory projects that uh, as we sequence more and more, that there may be as many as 80,000 genes in unique genes in this global population of Prochlorococcus, which is about three or three times uh, the human size of the human genome. So, so it's completely changed the way we think about what a bacterial species is and what it can do. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, Carla in Grantham, New Hampshire asks, what ages are the children's book for? Ah, um, I think technically speaking, maybe um, uh, kindergarten through third grade until they don't like picture books anymore. Um, but I always say they're, they're, they're really for people, not just for children. So uh, they're, I've had junior high students say that reading the, the first book on photosynthesis, that they understood it better than what they were learning in their science class. So it boils it down absolutely to the essence and it's, and it's pretty painless because Molly Bang, who's the co-author and illustrator of these books, and, and she's a very accomplished children's book writer and illustrator, and her pictures are just beautiful. So even, even tiny kids who certainly don't know what CO2 is or whatever can make up a story from the pictures. So, um, so I, I, I always say any age will do. Well, and I think it's a brilliant strategy to try and get at parents through the kids. Yeah. I mean, I loved reading books to my child when he was little. <laughs> Um, so Tim in Newton asks, uh, what does the map of Prochlorococcus concentrations look like around the world? Is it more concentrated in one ocean over another? Ah, good question. Um, their, their numbers are a little bit higher in the Pacific Ocean than the Atlantic. Um, the record concentration actually was in the Arabian Sea, um, was the highest concentration I think that's been published. But the, they, they're restricted to the mid-latitude waters. They don't like cold water. So maybe 45 degrees north, they go up, and 40 degrees south, and then they disappear as you go toward the poles. So broadly speaking, and for reasons we don't understand, uh, there are slightly more in the Pacific than in the Atlantic. <laughs> and Sam in Baltimore wants to know, what did it mean to you to get the National Medal of Science? 
Well, it, it was uh, incredibly uh, humbling, I guess is what the, uh, it was a shock. It's what <laughs> it, meant, it meant a lot to me um, be, because it recognized the significance of our field, really. Um, it's not, the, I think it was the first National Medal of Science that went to uh, an ocean, a biological oceanographer or somebody who studies uh, the biology of the ocean. So it was a recognition, again, that, that, that this field, by studying organisms in there where they live and studying organisms that aren't sort of traditional model systems like, like fruit flies and mice, um, can, can lead to advances that are, are, are sort of fundamentally uh, significant. So that, that, that meant a lot to me other than the, the thrill of, of going to the White House. Um, so it, it, was, it was quite amazing. I'm sure it was. Um, Rita in Houston asks, what was it like to have the Wu-Tang Clan visit your lab? <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, uh, that, that, that's an interesting, thank you for that question. Um, that was really interesting. Um, and there's a long story behind that, uh, but I, I found um, that it wasn't the whole clan. It was just Jizza, the, the one of the one of the rappers, um, and he was interested. In, actually, he's, he was planning a, to write a album on the oceans, and um, it got trumped by one on physics. He's got one coming out on on physics now, I think, called Dark Matter. But I'm hoping he's still thinking about the oceans. So. There was a sort of a link of, of people that knew people that knew people, and it ended up, you know, that, that I work on the oceans. And so he was wonderful. He visited two times. We gave him tours of the lab. Um, he gave a couple lectures at MIT, and I learned a lot about hip hop, and uh, I, I learned a lot from talking with him. Well, between the children's books and having a rap about the oceans, that would really get you a lot more visibility, I yeah. would imagine. <laughs> yeah. So Ryan in Cambridge asks, will ocean fertilization plans work out? What convinces you that this is a faulty plan? Ah, good question. Um, I've written uh, several articles on this and, uh, that th there's been a proposal that um, if you could f fertilize large regions of the oceans, you could enhance that CO2 in arrow, that you would cause phytoplankton blooms uh, that would draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and settle to the deep sea. And I mean, there's a long list of, of unintended side effects of that that, that, I, that I've written about. And any, anybody can feel free to email me and I'll send you articles about any of these things. But um, the, main, the two points are that the only way that will work is, is by design that system stimulates only those larger phytoplankton that I showed in the, in the first slide. Um, and, and the size of the phytoplankton determines everything else up the food web. So by design, if you were to do that, you change the ocean food web in ways that we can't possibly predict. But the other more important, well, equally important thing is that if you, if you do create a lot of additional carbon in the oceans, just like when you have phytoplankton blooms in coastal waters and you have these anoxic zones, uh, and fish die and float up to the surface, you would create low oxygen zones throughout the oceans by creating all this carbon in the deep water. And when you do that, there are certain kinds of bacteria that, that thrive that make methane and nitrous oxide, which are powerful greenhouse gases um, and, and collectively could make a, a worse situation. So, so those are two reasons of the, uh, concerning the side effects. And the other reason is that, that if you do projections with models, it really, if, if you fertilized all of the oceans, it really would not make that significant a difference in the trajectory of CO2 increases. Fascinating. Um, Harry in San Francisco uh, asks, what possible role, if any, can these microorganisms play in mitigating the effects of additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Is it possible that they can remove substantial amounts of the carbon dioxide being added through the combustion of fossil fuels, i.e. enough to prevent unacceptable temperature increases? Yeah, that's, that's a question sort of related to the, the ocean fertilization. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't think I don't know if that was asked in the context of, of actually using these organisms in the in the oceans, but 
But the one way I think that, that our research on prochlorococcus and other phytoplankton could contribute to um, reducing greenhouse gases is, is by contributing to our understanding of, of photosynthesis and how it works. Because ultimately, the biosphere works on, photosynth on solar energy through photosynthesis. And I think as humans, if we work toward using solar energy rather than this fossil photosynthate, um, that's a sustainable model. And so when we talk about our research on prochlorococcus, we say, that, you know, this is the minimal photosynthetic machine. This is the smallest amount of genetic information that can create biomass fuel uh, from solar energy with, with minimal other ingredients. Just all it requires is basic fertilizer, or inorganic compounds. And so we feel that our basic research on this could, could lead to um, innovation in terms of artificial photosynthesis. I mean, this is nature's design of the simplest photosynthetic machine. So, um, but that's way down the road. But I, in, in, in terms of that topic, I think that that's what motivates us to study um, prochlorococcus. So with such significant variability in the genomes of prochlorococcus in the various oceans and seas, what is the definition of species that allows the conclusion that they are all the same species? Or is it simply that they are all of the same genus? That was question came from Gary in Denver, Colorado. Good question. Um, we're actually letting go of the whole, of the term species. Um, and we, we use these names because they help us order things. We, we, we know we know a prochlorococcus when we see it. Uh, we can define its properties um, through its size and its pigments. And whether it's called a genus or a species, it, 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 it really doesn't matter. Um, the reason uh, they're all grouped together in what we would call a single species or a single genus and species is there's but one molecular marker that has been used in microbiology that says if if cells sequence in this one gene, the ribosomal RNA gene, um, differ by less than 3 percent, they belong to the same species. But that, 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 that's an operational definition. But by that definition, prochlorococcus was a species when we, when we first um, uh, were able to sequence what we had. And so, but this new image of the, it, it's like this pool of genes and they exchange genes with other species. and um, the, the new biology is going in this direction of understanding these microbial systems as, as re actually very fluid in terms of genes moving around with some coherence to these things. Um, Prochlorococcus has a coherence, but we have stopped talking about it as, as, a, as a, a genus or a species. We just call it Prochlorococcus, and then we name the strains. So um, will, will Prochlorococcus ever have play a role in desalination efforts? That was from Janine in Cambridge. Uh, no. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but I should confess that um, it, it's not a very easy organism to grow. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very temperamental. Uh, it, it, there are some relatives of Prochlorococcus that are much more um, lab rats, but Prochlorococcus is used to being out in the pristine open ocean um, and very low nutrient concentrations, and it, uh, it doesn't have a f rapid growth rate. It only doubles once per day. So in terms of actually using it as, a, as, a, as an agent to do anything in like large biomass, it, 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 in, in its present form, um, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing that. But we're working on ways to genetically manipulate it. Um, and, you know, at some point, we will uh, undoubtedly be able to make designer prochlorococcus that can <laughs> do whatever we want. But that, that isn't my goal, since I, I'm sort of in love with the beauty of the, of the way uh, nature has designed it. But, um, and we're learning a lot from that. So I guess the short answer to your question is, is no. Marcy in Winchester wants to know if genome sequencing is time intensive, how do you, and how do you prioritize what to devote lab energy to in projects that require such investments of time? Ah, good question. Um, the, the first genome that w was sequenced, it took us about eight months 
from submitting the DNA to, we didn't see, we don't sequence them ourselves. You, you submit them to a sequencing center. Um, submitting the DNA to, to actually getting the sequence. And now uh, the, the cost and speed of DNA sequencing um, is, just, is, is just amazingly advanced. And so we can sequence a genome in a, in a, in a, in a day and get the, the answer, and it's not that expensive. We just send it right across the street and, and we get the genomes back. So it's, it's completely changed the way uh, students think, can even think about what experiments they can do, and um, it, it's a very, very powerful tool. So Jason in Boston wants to know, what are your hopes for the newly christened MIT Plan for Action on Climate Change? Do you support the fossil-free MIT movement? Oh boy, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> Getting into politics. Yeah. <laughs> Do I support it? I support the students. Um, I, 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 I believe that their, um, their heart is in the right place. I feel that I'm not yet sure. I'm, I'm actually still on the fence about the divestment is, issue. Um, I'm not sure that that is, you know, I listen to both sides. Uh, I listen to the administration. Uh, I, I, I certainly feel that MIT should be working hard on the problem, um, and, but whether divestment is the best approach is still unclear to me, and I'm, I'm open to input from a number. Th this might be the young man I, I, I met at, a, at an alumni meeting recently who gave me some very compelling reasons, um, and, and so everything just went dark. Are we still on? <laughs> I don't know. Ah. There we go. Um, so anyway, I'm open to uh, input from anybody on that, on that topic. I'm still not sure whether divestment is the best path for MIT. Or where you can have the greatest impact. Right. So Therese in New York City wants to know, how do phenomena like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch affect Prochlorococcus? We don't really know. There's been very little. Um, research on, on that. Um, the, I, the, I know there are some people in Woods Hole who are studying, the, it's called the plastosphere, uh, these little pieces of, of plastic, not, not the ones that are visible, but the ones after it breaks down, uh, form little islands where bacteria settle. Bacteria love to settle on substrates. And whether Prochlorococcus uh, sort of joins in that, that rafting, is is not not clear at all yet. So we re we really don't know. And Michael, also in New York, is asking: Is cross scale systems biology and MIT at MIT a unique field? How are other universities approaching it? Good question. I'm not. I you know I I'm not sure anybody else actually calls it that. That, <laughs> uh, but um, I think that that we at MIT, uh, particularly in the civil and environmental engineering department, um, ha are, are developing, we have several faculty members studying microbes in the environment w from this perspective and are, are trying to build this, this field. And I know that also through the, the human microbiome uh, program, where, um, which is a huge program now um, nationally, studying the bacteria on, on humans, and um, many of the approaches that are being used there are approaches that were actually pioneered in, 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 in oceanography, studying the microbes in the ocean, and that is the ability to study the whole microbial community uh, together through metagenomics and other approaches. So it's been very exciting for me to watch that um, initiative build because they need to incorporate ecological theory and principles into studying basically the body as an ecosystem for, for microorganisms, the same way we study the ocean as an ecosystem for microorganisms. I mean, we, our body is, is, is really made up of lots of different types of bacteria. Fascinating. Karen in Framingham um, is going to take us back to talking about your children's books. How have children responded to your books? Are there things that we can learn about teaching adults about climate change by studying the way the kids learn about it? 
Ah, well, I, that is my hope. Um, and honestly, I don't really know much about how children uh, respond. The books, the books have been have gotten uh, well reviewed. We've gotten some awards. We got the Mass Book Award. We got two of them got awards from the um, American uh, Academy AAAS. Um, and so. So Is that the American Academy of Arts and Sciences? No, it's the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Science. Yeah. Okay. Um, they got the Subaru Award from them for best children's picture books, and um, so they're they're being well received. We're we're trying to get them more into the schools in the school curriculum, um, and but I I I haven't personally gone to schools and and seen how how children react. I did go to the MIT daycare center and mm -hmm. had a great uh, couple hours with the kids who, who had studied them and I was amazed and they were growing their plants and you know I was amazed at, at what they could take away from and they could talk about carbon dioxide and, and how, how, how what's the age range well they're the, uh, pre, infant preschool to, yeah, yeah infant preschool. to like four or something yeah yeah and some of them I you know I don't think they really knew but they what carbon dioxide was but just just I think we tried to be very scientifically correct, and even uh, Molly has, you know, molecules in the books that are scientifically correct. And uh, because I think kids are never too young to learn the language of science, even if it's, it doesn't mean exactly the same thing as when they get older. Uh, it doesn't hurt to to, lang to get the language right and 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 get the imagery, um, which is what we tried to to create. Well, and teaching them a new language during the period of time where their brain is absorptive of that right. is what makes total sense. And science is a language just like any other foreign language. Yeah. Um, Aaron in Cambridge asks, what international barriers are there to studying Prochlorococcus? Have you run into research boundaries due to international boundaries? Um, we haven't had any problems with that, but there, there are issues if you... Um, take samples, you know, within the 200 mile limit of countries. Um, you have to get certain permissions to do that. And, um, but most, Prochlorococcus doesn't actually like to grow near the, near the coast in most, in most places. It doesn't like to, like it doesn't like to grow off the coast of Massachusetts where we'd love to be able to study it, but <laughs> it doesn't like the continental shelf for some reason that we don't understand yet. Um, so we haven't run into any problems. You probably have to get special dispensation from TSA to take a bottle like that onto a plane. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. We send them through the mail if people want cultures. We put little book lights in, a, in with, a, with a tube, and then we send them through the mail, and they do pretty well. Mm, that's good. So Bob in Ohio asks, how do the algal blooms on Western Lake Erie relate to your research, if at all? Ah. Um, well, th it relates because a, a, a lot of what we do with Prochlorococcus is try to understand it, how it responds to different levels of nutrients. And in the open ocean where it grows, uh, the major nutrient input is from the deep water. When you have mixing, uh, the deep water comes up and that has much higher concentrations of nutrients than the surface water and that um, stimulates their growth. And so what we try to understand is, is, is which nutrients are most important in which oceans, for example, in the, in the Atlantic, phosphorus is much less available than in, than in the Pacific. Uh, in, the, in the Pacific, nitrogen is, is probably more important in regulating their growth. So in terms of blooms of algae in lakes, um, they're caused by nutrients. Nitrogen and phosphorus uh, run off from, from the land. Um, so it's exactly the same process, uh, but just in different ecosystems. And in the lakes and near the, where you have the runoff from the land, that excess nutrients uh, for that ecosystem causes these, these um, noxious blooms. And the way to solve it is to keep the nutrients from flowing into the system. So we've got time for uh, two or three more questions. Can you give us a sense of the breadth and depth of the research and industrial roles alumni of your lab now assume around the world? Um, boy, the, the alumni of my lab have gone in, in, in many different directions. Um, the, 
my first graduate student, ironically enough, um, <clears throat> worked on, on biofuels. He worked on, this is way before Prochlorococcus. We were working on some of those big, those big phytoplankton. And he studied the effects of nutrient availability, particularly nitrogen, on lipid production by different uh, species of phytoplankton. And I noticed recently a review where that paper, which was, was back in like 1980, I think, um, is still one of the most cited biofuel papers uh, that, that are out there, uh, which gives me some pleasure. So if you do, do really good basic science, it's still useful even today um, in people working on biofuels. But I also have students uh, working on Prochlorococcus at, at, at different universities around the country. Um, and um, some of them have gone into private industry. I'm trying to go through my, my Rolodex here. Yeah. Uh, some of them are working for um, the government. So, so there, there are multiple many different outlets for, for having gotten a PhD in, in this field. And in fact, my graduate students were, come, were from many different programs, some the joint program in oceanography, some in civil and environmental engineering, some uh, in joint program in chemical oceanography, some in the P microbiology PhD program at MIT. So they came, the, my lab is made up of, of students from very diverse backgrounds, and so they go off and do a lot of different things. Sonam in Cambridge asks, what are the greatest enemies of Prochlorococcus? And what is there within it that may ever lead to its undoing? Ooh. Um, well, they're, they're, they're eaten by tiny little protozoa um, and that sort of single-celled um, algae. In some cases, they're eaten by other photosynthetic organisms. And they're eaten about as fast as they grow. So they divide once a day, and they get eaten just about that same speed. So their, their levels out there stay very constant. It's, it's an incredibly rapidly turning over system. Um, there are also viruses that, that infect them and um, use them to reproduce. But we've come to, th to actually think of those viruses as, as actually part of their system, because they incorporate Prochlorococcus genes and move them around, so they generate some of this genetic diversity. Um, and in terms of their demise, I always say uh, I think they'll be here long after we're not. Um, <laughs> the, recently, there have been some models uh, projecting their abundance if, if uh, when we have uh, global warming. And uh, because they, they do tend to like warm water, and as the oceans warm, um, the warm water spreads north and south. Uh, so there's, it's projected a, a significant increase in their abundance uh, with global warming. So uh, the only thing that would, if we did fertilize the oceans, that would uh, definitely have an impact uh, on their abundance uh, on, on a global scale. But, other, other, other than that, um, I think they're pretty safe. Do you still work closely with the Woods Hole Inst Oceanographic Institution? And can you tell us a little bit about how MIT and Woods Hole are related? How are, are, are they still closely intertwined? Um, yeah, MIT and Woods Hole have a joint graduate program, the MIT Hui Joint Program in Oceanography and Oceanographic Engineering, I think it's called. And um, so they're Really, that's their formal arrangement. They're intertwined through that educational program. And um, I'm involved in that through being on, on student committees, um, thesis committees. Uh, and, I, and in the past, I've had graduate students in that program. And we uh, have, over the years, uh, I have a cottage down in Woods Hole, so I spend significant amount of time in the summers down there interacting with colleagues. So when I first came to MIT, that really was where my oceanography colleagues were. So I had strong interaction uh, in those days. But um, our, the, the field has built more expertise at MIT since then. Uh, and one final question. Can you talk just a little bit about being named institute professor and what that meant to you and your work? How does that, does that change your work in any way? Interesting. Um, yeah, that, that was another, like the National Medal of Science, came as, a, as an enormous shock. And, and again, um, you know, I felt very heartened by the fact that 
MIT is, is, is recognizing my field, which is, you know, is not really mainstream kind of MIT activity um, as, as significant, I think, through, through making me a, an institute professor. And um, it's been, it's pretty new. It just happened this summer, so I don't yet know how, how it will change um, anything that, that, I, that I do, uh, other than it changes your reporting structure at MIT, and basically, you know, we, we were told uh, you do anything you want. So uh, it's a it's a wonderful gives you a tremendous amount of freedom um, to pursue any any path and to mold your you know sort of your MIT existence in a way that that you find fulfilling. So I'm deeply um, grateful for MIT, and I, I always say that um, if it weren't for MIT and Prochlorococcus. None of these things would have, would have happened. So I give them equal credit for any, any honor that, that comes to, to me. And, and really, it's the MIT students um, that, that have made an enormous difference in, in my career. And, and, and I'm forever grateful to all of you out there. How long have you been at MIT, Penny? Since 1976. Wow. Yeah. And so was that your entire career? Yeah, this was my first my first job <laughs> after wow. my postdoc, yeah. Well, aren't we lucky? Yeah. Uh, on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association, thank you very much for joining us today, and thanks to our viewing audience for um, logging in and, and uh, participating. Uh, you can continue to discuss these topics on our blog, The Slice of MIT, and on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag MIT Faculty. You can also view an archive of past faculty forums online by visiting the Learn section on the Alumni Association website. Please join us next month for another session of the Faculty Forum online, and thank you.